Rumors and leaks about a Nintendo Switch revision have been flying around left and right. Nintendo themselves have said that they don't have anything to announce at the time, which is technically true because they didn't announce anything else at that time. As for this, I'm going to do a half speculation, half what if I could decide what features the new Switch would have, or the Switch revisions would have. So the first question that might be asked is, why would they do it now? I think the easy answer is because it's possible to do it now. You may be familiar with Moore's Law, and if you aren't, it's simply that with any given amount of time, the amount of components on a computer chip will be doubled, usually it's around two years. And that has an extra benefit. It means you can have less space to have the same amount of components, and you get other benefits as well, such as reduced heat, reduced cost of production, and reduced power consumption. And these can be especially important whether it's a home system or a handheld. And of course, if you want to do a major console revision, usually that shrinks the system, you need to be able to shrink the components as well. But often you don't even need to actually change the whole system. There are plenty of revisions that change the internals and externals while leaving the main form roughly the same. This is why I say the Switch could actually have up to three revisions. The first one keeps the standard form, and I'll call it the Switch 1.5, and may even come with a little price drop if the components are inexpensive enough by that time. Uh, the biggest external change, and probably the most important, is that it comes with at least one more SD card slot. That is very important when it comes to having more digital downloads, since it effectively needs more space. And there will be an extra kickstand or a wider one to accommodate that, which may make tabletop mode a bit easier. The internal changes where, if it's possible, we would also have the internal memory increased. The motherboard will be reduced, and it's pretty small anyway, but it will be reduced as much as we can, and this way we could add an increased passive cooling system that will not only help the fan cooling down the system, but maybe even replace it in handheld mode, which could increase the battery life. When Digital Foundry did a video on a stronger switch, they suggested things like a stronger Wi-Fi receiver and a USB plug that's up to the new C compliance standards. Now we come to the Mini, which I am calling the Switch Compact. It would have a price between $150 and $200. Aside from the kickstand, this would have the same features as the 1.5. Now I can't take credit for the clamshell design, because that, that was actually suggested by the YouTube channel Hot Take when they were talking about a possible Switch Mini. The link to that video will be in this description. As for the design, I was thinking a couple extra things could be added, such as little holes to place the analog sticks when the clamshell is closed. The analog sticks themselves would probably be about the size of those of the PlayStation Vita, just would have the clicking function. And when the clamshell is closed, it will be slightly shorter than the Switch w without the Joy-Cons attached, but it would be about as wide and be about as thick. That would mean you could still fit this in the dock. Now, I know some have insisted that this wouldn't have any sort of docking compatibility, but one of their leaks suggested that this would merely have a focus on a handheld mode, not be exclusive to it. And if you're thinking, why, wouldn't it cost less to take away the docking ability? No, it would only cost less to take away the dock. When people looked at the Switch's insides, they noticed that there were no extra chips or processors for the dock mode. Everything that worked in dock mode worked in portable modes. The only difference was dock mode overclocked some of the processors. So there's no real saving to taking out the ability to use the dock mode, other than taking out the dock itself, so that would be sold separately, along with the Joy-Cons. The system will still be compatible with both, you're just trading them not being in the box for a lower price. Unlike the dock, there is actual extra hardware in the Joy-Cons that isn't used in the handheld mode. It's just used in tabletop mode and dock mode. These include the advanced motion controls, the infrared camera, and the HD rumble. So in this case, you would just have dual analog controls with regular rumble and motion sensors that are about the same as on the 3DS, maybe even using the exact same sensor, so you can still have gyro aiming in some games. The D-pad replaces the left base button, since that's what they were functionally were anyway, and the shoulder buttons will be like the new 3DS or original classic controller, so that the clamshell when closed would be as flat as possible. Since the DS systems used XL for larger sizes, not more powerful hardware, I'm going to call this the DX instead, the Deluxe, of course. This has even more SD card slots than the other systems, and a heck of a lot more internal memory. If the Tegra X2 chip is available, we would use that, and a lot more RAM. 
With these extra components, it might have the same heat and power consumption as the regular Switch, but we would have an even stronger cooling system. A second battery or larger battery would be included. Before having advanced graphics, the first priority is enhancing the performance. So games that have trouble reading the system's main resolution would have a much easier time on this system and have a much steadier frame rate. Handheld mode would let you switch between the enhanced performance and have roughly the same battery life as the regular Switch, or you could have the same performance and enhanced battery life. Dock mode may have 4K upscaling, but no 4K textures. That would be just way too much ROM size. This would of course include the dock, and as you can see on the frame, there are gray indents so you'd have an easier time centering. Also included are larger controllers that I'm calling the Joy DXs. These will not only be larger to meet the new size of the system, but also for larger hands. My hands are just about the size where it's not uncomfortable to hold the older PlayStation DualShock, I mean the 1 through 3, but they are too big to hold the Joy-Cons comfortably. If these were a bit taller, say about as tall as the Wii remotes, that would be just fine, so that's what these are made for. These also include regular D-pads for better 2D play, and the way I locked in the system means that you can easily lock the regular Joy-Cons on the sides as well. These may require a new grip, which can be sold separately or include one in the box. Now the intention of the Switch DX is not to have exclusive games. All games that run on this would run on the regular Switch just much better. Maybe not as extreme as Hyrule Legends, but it's still much better. And some of the Switch DX games may still have to make some compromises to run as well as some of the more powerful systems. Eh, you just wouldn't need as many. And some older Switch games may even have a patch which gives better performance if it's used in the DX. But does this guarantee more games coming to the Switch? Maybe, but there's also the matter of ROM size. Switch cards are apparently still expensive to make and really eat into profit margins for physical games. Now, with a lot of Switch games being part on the card and part download, you might assume that some games would just use the 8GB card, or whatever is smaller, and just have the rest be download. That's where the system memory comes into play. It might be possible that future games might come with part of themselves on the cart, and the rest on an included SD card, which in basically includes the rest of the game in digital form. This assumes that larger SD cards will have a good enough profit margin to do so, but it's one way that could be done. This is why I mentioned before that the extra SD card slots are so important. It's to get around the restriction that a lot of developers said have been holding them back from putting more games on the system. With a large enough internal memory, maybe they could even include Red Dead Redemption 2. Although they could still port the first game, with Undyne Nightmare included. But wait, there's more! That hot take video I mentioned previously also brought up the possibility that this could have 3DS compatibility in the revisions. They brushed that off, and I initially did too, but that got me thinking. What if they did include that? How could it be done? Incidentally, some may be wondering why Nintendo has been still supporting 3DS. Simple, they're not EA. They're not going to drop a source of revenue that's still making some money just because it stopped making all of the money. The last time Nintendo prematurely dropped support for a popular system was the original Wii, and a lot of customers felt really burned, and Nintendo cannot afford to do that again. But anyway, as for including that full backwards compatibility, it's an interesting notion. I mean, whoever heard of a console revision adding backwards compatibility? It, it might be a first. Anyway, backwards compatibility means we're not doing ports. We're actually allowing full use of the system on it. So the first thing needed is of course a cartridge slot, which may not cost a lot to include. I hope it doesn't. But the most important thing is the processor. Yes, the Tegra does use an ARM processor, but I'm not sure it's the same kind used on the DS line. This matters because if the system architecture isn't something that the game recognizes, you can't do hardware emulation. You'd have to rely on software emulation, and even a more powerful Switch wouldn't be able to do that. So if the three architectures aren't the same, we would have to include at least one CPU that's the same type used in the DS's. It may not have to be too powerful, just enough to ensure compatibility while the Tegra does the rest of the processing. Now, I don't know if that's even possible to do with processors right now, but I bet there are some people trying to make it happen. So the extra CPU would only be included if it did not add too much to the cost of the system. From this point, we're going to assume all of the revisions can include it. That just leaves the question of the multiple screens. If the clamshell design is used, then it would simply be a matter of adding the second screen, but that would only be included if the extra cost would be minimal. 
If it isn't, then we would just use the same thing that I'm going to show for the other screens. This is something I've been thinking about even if there were going to be DS and 3DS ports to the system. Since the resolution of the handheld mode is bigger than both of the DS screens and 3DS screens combined, it's just a matter of placing them. So in this possible scenario, you would start with both screens centered and at actual size. The two buttons on the side are not part of the game, they're part of the OS. They stand for Resize and Move, and pressing either one toggles a mode where you can change the screens accordingly. You can also put them side by side and make one screen bigger than the other. For games like Elite Beat Agents, you probably want to make the bottom as big as you can. This could still apply in dock mode because the Joy-Cons have a pointer function. It wouldn't be as good as a natural touchscreen, but we're working with what we have. There can even be a straight vertical orientation that you can use in tabletop mode, or dock mode if you're able to turn your screen sideways, and some people can. Anyway, thank you to this look into the future of what the new systems could be, which we may find out as much as two days after this video is recorded. My next video is less speculation, but more of a wish list. Until the next upload!